My name's Eric. If we've not met, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to Journey. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here. We appreciate you coming to worship with us, and we pray that you've already enjoyed your experience so far, and I hope I don't mess it up in Jesus' name. So uh, as part of the message today, one of the major themes that you're going to see in the life of the person that we'll be talking about is that God intended to use his life as a mission field afterwards, that God would use him to bring many people unto salvation. And right from the get-go, I think we need to keep that in mind all the time as believers. I want to just reiterate a little bit of what Brinson shared about the spirit behind that wrestling event on Saturday night. It might be crazy. You know, we actually had a couple people email the, I ain't going to your church no more because you haven't wrestling up at your church. And I'm like, oh my goodness, come on Jesus, right? So first and foremost, we need to understand something. This building is not a sanctuary. It is not the temple of the Lord. It is a building. It actually was a sprint call center before we moved into here. So it was one day sprint call center, right? So Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners. Can I get an amen? amen. He was a friend of sinners. He went and met people where they were at. How amazing and awesome is it an opportunity? Because what scripture also teaches is that we are the temple of the Lord. Wherever we go, we carry him with us. So I want to encourage you. Maybe wrestling is not your thing, but would you make it your thing on Saturday night? Would we fill this place up, and would we invite some people who maybe would never go to church? How many of you, you know some people where you think, that, that person ain't never going to church, right? <laughs> they ain't never going to church. But if you invited them to come to a wrestling match, they might actually show up. I promise we won't hit you over the head with a chair. Well, maybe, maybe, it, it, it could happen. Um, but it'll be a great night, so please use this as an opportunity. And yes, there is a side benefit. There's many youth that uh, come through the doors of Journey and on the outside that may not have the resources to actually attend youth camp. So it is a big fundraiser for us to raise money for that event as well. We want to see every youth be able to go there and have a great time and see their lives transformed this coming summer as well. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get right into God's word. Father, we thank you and praise you. You are our God and King. And this morning as we listen to this epic story of your grace, uh, Lord, may we be reminded that all of the Bible is one huge story of your love for us throughout all time. Lord, we can't thank you enough for your presence already here through worship. Would you use the word to impact us? Would you change us? Would you transform us? For those who need hope, would you use this as a moment to really instill hope in their lives? For those who find themselves in the midst of waiting on you, would you give them courage for the wait? Would you remind us all that when you implant a dream in our heart, you will bring it to fruition, that we don't need to shortcut it and do things on our own way, in our own path, that if we're patient, if we're obedient, if we learn, Learn during that refining time, Lord, you will take us to places that we could never even imagine. And we pray that that will happen with many in this very room today, that dreams will be rekindled, that our spirits will be ignited, that some would come to know you for the first time, and others' faith would be reinvigorated in you today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. That's why we're gathered here. Amen, amen, and amen. So we've kicked off this new series that we've been in for a few weeks here at Journey. We're calling it Epic. It really is going to last the whole year, but we're going to break it into different sections each month. We're going through a different section. And the past month, we've been really reading in Genesis, and that'll kind of conclude today. The book of Genesis is going to come to an end. So if you haven't finished that, be sure to wrap up the book of Genesis and start reading on into the book of Exodus. I had someone come up to me in between services, and they were like, man, I've been reading ahead, and then you've shared on the weekends, and then we've been sharing it in our men's group, and I'm the kind of person that I really need to hear it a couple times so I can get it. Anybody else like that? You know, might need to repeat it two or three times for us to really get it and grasp it and get it down deep within us. And he's like, man, I am so thankful for the kind of stuff that I've been learning, and I hope you're already having that same kind of an experience. If you're not, I encourage you to dive into God's word. I promise you, he will speak to you. He will transform you if you spend time with him. Get with him in that private time. For some of you, that might be in the morning. For others of you, that might be in the evening. For some, it might be during your lunchtime. But take time out of your schedule to prioritize God into it, and I promise you that he will move. So we've already heard about some stories like God is the creator of the universe. Man fell, right? That was a pretty deep one. Y'all realize we're jacked up and in need help of a rescue, right? We all need Jesus in our life. We talked about Abraham and his faith and the promises of God and that when they come true, 
man, does it reassure us. And today we're going to look at the life of another person in the Bible that I hope will show you that God's promises do come true, that if he puts a plant and, and plants a dream in your heart, that you can have faith in it, you can trust in it, and you can be there and see God really move in your life. So how many of you, when you got in Scripture, you maybe reached one of those sections of Scripture where it was so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so Do you all know the kind of scriptures that I'm talking about? Those aren't often the most fun place to read, right? You get in there and you're like, oh my God, as a tip, don't start in that particular section of scripture. Don't start in the section that says so-and-so begat so-and-so. But there is something in every section of God's word that has meaning. So when you look at that section of scripture that you might have recently read with us, um, one of the things that you're going to see is the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The lineages. So what they're doing in there is they're telling us lineages that ultimately lead to and validate the birth of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, right? So in the recent scripture that we read, we talked about Abraham, we talked about his son Isaac and his son Jacob, and then Jacob ends up having 12 children, one of whom is named Joseph, who will be the focus of our study today. So each and every one of those verses is very important. So I want to encourage you, maybe when you reach a section of scripture like that, you're like, man, this is hard to move through. I want to skip over it. Grab a couple of the names in there and maybe just Google them and see what God says. Put that person's name and put scripture next to it. You might find out some incredible things that just ignite that particular section of scripture. So I pray that you fall in love with the Word of God. So as we dive into this story about this guy named Joseph, it really starts with a dream. God implants a dream on his heart. So that's where we're going to begin today in Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 5. It says, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. They said to him, hear this dream I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to them, are you indeed reigning over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words, right? So the story starts off with a dream. We're introduced first in this story to this band of brothers, right? There's 12 of them. How many of you grew up with siblings? How many of you had siblings growing up? I was an only child, which means I was really jacked up. I mean, I had all kinds of issues for most of my life and still do, and they have to put up with me for that. I had stepbrother and sister that came later into my life. But if you had brothers and sisters, you know um, that there's sibling rivalry from time to time, right? Y'all, any, y'all scrapped with your brother or sister? How many of y'all, you got into it, you fought with it, right? How many of you got your head stuck in the toilet when you were a kid? Come on, Jesus. There's a few of you. You were on the, that end of it. Yep, that, that's how it went. Um, so... What you're seeing a little bit at work here is a family dynamic, right? A part of it that's taken to the extreme, as we'll see in some of the next scriptures. But you got a couple of brothers that are jealous about what God is speaking to this one brother, and it's leading them all the way to a very strong word called hate. Now, some of you know about this. In your family, there was like one kid that seemed like they were the one that got loved a little bit more than everybody else. Molly, um, uh, um, you know, that, you know, in every family, there's that one that they seem like they're loved more than everybody else. And all the brothers and sisters hate that about them. Now, if you didn't get that part of the experience, that means you were that one. You were the one with the issues and you're still dealing with them today. You were the preferred child, right? And uh, we, these are just part of the family dynamic if we're, uh, uh, you know, honest about it. The easy to love ones. Come on, Jesus. The people pleasers. So I don't want to make too light of that. Yes, it's a little bit of fun, but you're seeing some harsh words here. And some of the other things that you'll see at play in the midst of it is, first and foremost, God is telling something significant to Joseph. He's put this dream on his heart that one day he will be a leader. Now, if God's putting something on your heart, one of the things we learn right from the get-go is you have to know the time and place to share it as well, right? So in his immaturity, he shares it to them in such a way that makes them feel all the more inferior, so the hate comes out of them all the more. So there's this sense of immaturity at times where we're given a God birth dream, and we want to tell the world about it. We want to do it, and if you're not careful, you could tell it uh, to people in a way that might be creating more offense than creating a celebration around you. 
Sadly, at the same time, I think there's another dynamic at work that we all need to contend with. When God is taking your life to the next level, sometimes those closest around you are the ones that want to hold you back. Have you ever experienced that, right? It's sad. Maybe we at times have done that to other people as well, where we see God moving and them growing and a jealousy kind of boils up in our heart. Like, God, why are you promoting them and you're not promoting me? What's going on? So there's this odd dynamic at place in there about that as well, where the people closest to you at times, if we're sick in our sin, we want other people to fail somewhere deep down because it makes us feel better, as odd as that is, right? The Lord needs to work that out in us if we're in that kind of a place, because as believers, he wants us to celebrate with other people when God's moving in their life. When God's taking them to the next level, we should be there to come alongside of them and encourage them and celebrate what God is doing, not look down upon it or not try to beat them down about it. So oftentimes in scripture, you'll see what I call border bullies. You'll get to experience them when they get to the Red Sea and they're about to go across. There's people or giants that want to rise up against you, your own fears or people from outside of you that want to keep you from accomplishing the God birth dream that is inside of you. So you're seeing that at work in here. So I want to ask you right from the start of our message, what dreams has God implanted on your heart that maybe haven't come all the way true yet? You find yourself in a little bit of that waiting period right now. One of the things you need to know is the devil is going to come against it. We need to come to expect that. The devil does not want to see you thrive. He does not want to see your life go to the next level. So when you see opposition coming your way, there's a couple of filters we need to begin to put it through. Is it the devil trying to thwart what God is doing? Then guess what? You should rejoice. You should rejoice. We should be seeing that. Devil, I see your schemes. I see what you're trying to do. You're not going to keep me down. You're not going to put me down. God birthed this dream in my heart. I'm going to continue to press on. I'm going to continue to glorify God. Amen. And then other times we got to deal and contend with ourselves as well in the midst of that in our own discouragement. Is it from outside of us or is it us? We experience some temporary setbacks and then are we ready to give up all too quick on the dream that God's planted in our heart? Or might we endure through it and face what I'm going to call the refining fire of God in the midst of it because he's planning and preparing a better future for you later and he has you in that waiting period. But if you're in that place, I want to encourage you to continue to worship, continue to trust, continue to believe, because if God truly planted it in your heart, I'm telling you, no devil in hell is going to keep you from it. If you'll keep pressing on, God will help you. He will be there for you. And guess what? Joseph is about to enter into a difficult spat. He gets this God birth dream but well, one of the things that you're going to see, and I hope it encourages you as well, is the opposition that comes against him, whether from the devil, whether from the outside, whether from his own heart, it bends him but does not break him. He allows it to refine him and turn him into the person that God wants him to be. So let's see a little bit deeper into this. So he goes out, his brothers are out there in the field in Genesis 37, 18. They saw Joseph from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. So that's where I said it's a little bit deeper than sibling rivalry here. They're ready to kill the guy, right? Aren't you glad these aren't your brothers? Amen. <laughs> Maybe it felt like that at times, but these guys are ready to take them out. They're already conspiring in their minds the lie that they're going to tell to their dad. I mean, this stuff has gone deep into that sin space, but I want to lift up something right from the beginning. Yet God, yet God was still at work. It doesn't matter what their intents are, what that devil is placing in their heart. It does not matter because God is still in control. Yet God, when I read this, it reminded me of another verse in the Bible where it says, what the enemy intends for evil, God turns around for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. In this story and in your life, God wants to work things out for your good and his glory. And that's what we're going to witness in the midst of scripture today. Never, ever forget that. Because even in the midst of this difficult circumstance, what you're going to see is they decide not to kill him. Thank you, Jesus. They decide not to kill him. But instead, they throw him into a pit. And then they see some people coming across. And 
one of the brothers has a little bit of wisdom and says, let's not kill him. Would you sell him into slavery? As if that's a great alternative, right? So they sell him into slavery. But in the midst of that, he had to enter into this pit to start God's plans and processes churning, to start the wheels of God moving to get him to the place where he's going to go. But I don't know about you. The second I got thrown in the pit, I'd probably have given up. Anybody else being honest, right? God gave me this dream, but now I'm in a pit. Now I'm sold into slavery. Are you kidding me? Genesis 37, 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites, so his brothers sell him to the Midianites, and then the Midianites, it says, sold him to eat into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Think about this in the natural for just a second, how God is beginning to set this up. So they think that they're doing away with him. They go and throw him in a pit. They end up selling him into slavery. They say, this guy's never going to be seen again. He's going to be gone. We're going to go tell dad that he died. We're going to put some fake blood on the coat of many colors that he has. We're going to give it to dad. And then God ends up positioning him this close to none other than Pharaoh himself, the most powerful man on the planet at that time. Like the most powerful guy that was out there, the ruler of the known world at that particular moment. Pharaoh was a god on earth, a little G god nonetheless. He was not the big G god of the universe. He's a little G god, but he wielded great power. So if he's to rule and reign at this moment, he probably couldn't see it. But God's positioning him this close to Pharaoh, the ruler on earth at that time. Now, when it comes to this, I want to start to talk about some, a, a new word I want to talk about for a second um, that might get you through. What is he going to need in his life in addition to faith to be able to make it to the next level? Uh, when, I was, when I was much younger, I was working for a law firm, and one of their offices was in Naples, Florida. And I could remember this day just like it was back then. Um, I went into the offices there, and I was introducing myself to the attorneys. I was there to help them fix up their computers. And usually attorneys are always very busy. They've got a lot of work to do. They're trying to make money. Most of the attorneys didn't give the time of day to us little computer guys. They just didn't do it. But this particular attorney had a, a um, it, it wasn't a painting like the one that I'm going to show you, but he actually had like a sculpture that was there, and it was a boat being tossed on the sea. Hopefully they could put that up there. I think they've got a copy of that. The AV team will get that up there in a second. But there was a boat being tossed on the sea, much like that one, an old boat. And on the back of that boat was the name Perseverance. And I said, why do you have that big, you know, sailboat thing on your, on your uh, desk or whatever on the back of the desk? And he says, man, it was a life lesson for me. Can I share it with you? And I'm like, sure, I'd love to hear the story. I'd love to hear the story behind it. And he said, what I've learned in life and about success in life has a lot to do with perseverance. In each of our lives, there's going to be these seasons of growth. There's going to be these seasons of success. And there's these other moments where life's going to get really difficult. Or you're going to be tossed around by the seas. And if you have a business, as an example, he would said, the, the biggest difference I've seen between businesses that survive and thrive and make it to the end and do very well and those who don't, there's one characteristic that they have. It's perseverance. And I was like, man, there's something profound in that because all of us will get tossed around from time to time and our dreams are going to get thrashed from side to side. But we need to remember maybe that scene in the New Testament where Jesus comes and he ultimately calms the seas, right? He does it at a point where they're all freaking out. And I think we do the same thing, right? We're all freaked out. God, my plans aren't coming together. God, I'm stuck in this job that I don't want to be in. God, this is going on. This is going on and that's going on. I don't know what to do. And God comes and says, peace, be still. He says, persevere through those times. Maybe that's an encouragement to someone who's here today to just keep pressing on. God's got a purpose and a plan and a dream that he's planted in your heart. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep fighting. You might be in a difficult spot, but keep fighting. Trust in the process. And don't, like we talked about last week, try to shortcut God and make your own path and your own plan. Because if you do, it will end in a shipwreck, I completely assure you, right? Follow God's plan. Let him do his refining work in your life, but don't be too quick to throw in the towel either. God's not done with you yet, especially if he's planted that thing in your heart. Can I get an amen to that? Amen, amen, and amen. I truly believe that God's plans for you are so much bigger than you or I could even imagine 
Now, we know that that was not the first or last twist in Joseph's life. In fact, there's going to be a few more twists and turns. He goes from being in a pit to starting to prosper, as you're going to see here in Genesis 39, verse 2. Now, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master. The master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended to him. He made him an overseer of the house and put him in charge of all that he had. From that time, he made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had had. The Lord blessed um, the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had on the house and on the field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. That's anointing, that is favor, that is wisdom, that is God's promotion. And maybe Joseph felt he made it. I don't know about you, I'd have been like, yeah, I made it. I'm ruling, I'm in this place of position of power. I'm with one of Pharaoh's top guys. He's given me charge over all the house. I've tried to do it and lead with godly wisdom. I've tried to do this. And maybe the plan's starting to come together, right? It looks like things are starting to move forward for him. He's excited about it, and maybe you've experienced the same thing. You got a business going, or some aspect of your life was really moving in the right direction, and you were all excited, and then something came and slapped you from the side, like we're going to see in just a moment. So one of two things happen when you start to be successful. Do you continue to give glory to God like he does, or do you start to think you did it all on your own? Because sometimes we do that, right? We start to think that we're the ones that brought us to that place. And then things don't end up going the way that we do. And even when things are going the way that they should from the outside natural, sometimes there's more curveballs that begin to come our way. So if you're not familiar with this story, maybe you're new to the faith or exploring the faith as you're here today, um, what ends up happening is this guy's wife ends up wanting to have sex with Joseph, and he actually is an honorable man, and he wants to turn away from that and say, no, I would never do that to my master. I would never sell him out in that way. I would not do that. And she turns on him, and she rips the, the clothes that were there, and she ends up accusing him of rape. And he finds himself in jail. You know, there's nothing new under the sun when you look at some of the stuff that's going on in modern day politics. Much of it, God forbid, those men that are doing stupid things to women, they should be a disgrace. They should be punished. They should have the sin in their lives called out. Um, And then reverse in certain circumstances where it's crazy like this, it happens sadly too. All the headlines that we see today are just a repeat of what's going on historically. Why? Because we're all sinners. Every one of us is sinners. We all are in need of a rescue. We all need the help of the Lord. Every one of us, right? So there's nothing new under the sun. This is all a repeat performance. So that's one of the other reasons I love reading the word is because you see all this stuff plain as day. Man, I encourage you to dive in if you're not already doing so. You'll see that, guess what? The devil is a dream killer that's trying to keep you from your dreams, but God will shine through if we could stay on point. So his wife lusts after him. He ends up going and getting thrown into jail. Um, How awful is that? It's terrible. But look at what happens even in the jail in Genesis 39, 23. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So he finds himself in jail, and then I guess there must have been opportunities to serve within the jail where he ends up being like the jail keeper's right-hand man and rises all the way up in leadership inside of the jail. You can't stop God's anointing. You can't stop God's anointing. Now, I'll tell you a slight glimpse of this. I am no Joseph by any means, but to just tell you how funny God is, you know, I knew that there was a little bit of a calling for leadership on my life very early, and uh, it was something that I always desired to do. It was something that I knew um, God had planted on my heart, and through my own sin, I was derailing that through my addiction, through the pain that I found myself in and the chemical usage that I was doing. And I, uh, he, he ended up in jail for righteous reasons. I ended up in a treatment center because I was sinning and I was jacked up, right? So in our treatment center, they actually had kind of a voting thing where they would vote in like the president of the uh, treatment center that would help facilitate certain things. Guess who ends up getting voted in as the president of the treatment center for the duration of the thing? I mean, like, if God's anointing is upon you, I'm telling you, God will endure even in the midst of some crazy things. 
Don't give up, people. Don't give up. Don't shortchange yourself. God's hand is upon you, and God wants to see you thrive. Can I get an amen? Sadly, as I indicated last time, God's timing is far different than ours. Can we endure through the weight in this generation of instantaneousness that we find ourselves in? Because when you read scripture, it's going to be a bit longer before he gets to the place where God really wants him to be. In fact, we know from scripture that he's actually stuck in jail for a number of years, at least two years he's unrighteously stuck in jail. Genesis 41, 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They quickly called him out of the pit. He had shaved himself and changed his clothes. He came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that you, when you hear a dream, you can't interpret it. Joseph answers Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So what ends up happening here is during his time in jail, there's some fellow inmates that are in the jail who had dreams that were birthed by God. One was a pretty bad one because the dude's head like gets cut off or something like that, but he predicts it correctly. Dude, you're going to go out and you're going to get killed. I don't think the guy liked that one, but it came true. And then the other one was that this other guy was going to get restored who worked for Pharaoh and God would bring him back to the place where he would be by Pharaoh's side. And then that guy forgets about him for two years until this moment. So when he's leaving, he's like, dude, remember what I told you? Help me get out of here, bro. Yeah, I got your back. And then he forgets about him until two years later when this situation happens that we just read. And then Pharaoh has a dream. And then he remembers, oh, this guy interpreted my dream. Look at the twists and turns yet again in both the natural and the supernatural. So he, do you think in any way, shape, or form, if he wasn't thrown into the pit and thrown into the slavery, what Jew would have found his way to Egypt? What Jew would have ever gotten there? It just wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have gone there on his own. So God had to let these circumstances that seem so terrible, these circumstances that seem so trying, God had to allow them to happen because ultimately he gets put near Potiphar that's one step away from where Pharaoh is. And then now through this circumstance coming out of jail again, he finds himself standing in front of the king. It would be like standing in front of Donald Trump or something in our generation as the president. You're in that presidential oval office and the president's asking you to speak to him and interpret what's going on. How crazy is that? It never would have been able to happen in the natural, yet God, but God, right? And then when you think of the dreams, when you start to think about the supernatural, God gives him a dream at the beginning of his life. And now we come full circle to another dream that the Pharaoh has and God's positioned him with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and supernatural discernment to interpret that dream. Do any of you lack any faith of God when you see this? Only God could orchestrate such events. Only God could put these things into practice. May that be an encouragement to each and every one of us who are here, especially if you're going through it today. If you're that person who wants to be a mom and it hasn't come through for you yet, I'm telling you, keep pressing in, keep believing. God has a way where there seems to be no way. If you're stuck in that job and it feels like purgatory and you're supposed to have a business that you know that God has birthed in your heart and it feels like you're stuck there, but God, yet God, embrace the time and the season that you find yourself in because chances are God's doing a refining work in your heart during that season. Don't try to get ahead of God and do it on your own way. Allow the refinement to work because promotion is around the corner. He's going to position you where he needs you to be to influence kings at times. How amazing is that? And as you're going to see in a moment, I'll bring you full circle to the beginning. If you still have breath in your life and in your lungs after you got saved, he saved you for a mission. He didn't save you for himself. He didn't save Joseph just so Joseph could be saved. He positions Joseph in such a way so that he can influence and help many people around him, as you're going to see. If you're saved, your purpose in life is to go beyond the walls of the church. Get out of yourself. Get out of your comfort zone and go out there and tell the world about what Jesus has done in your life. That's the calling he has upon you. He called you as a difference maker to bring him glory to tell the world about him with the hope that many would get saved that many would get rescued. That is the story of God in each of our lives. Let me begin to wrap it up. 
If you read this story, if you're new to the story, what ends up happening is the Pharaoh has a dream, a dream about seven good years and about seven bad years. Seven years that would be extremely abundant and under normal circumstances, maybe take us like the world that we live in today. We've lived in a world where the stock market has gone up to unprecedented levels. There's been tons of wealth that's been created for some people, not all of us, you know, but God has done something where you've seen this miraculous uptick. Now, what are these people doing with that enormous wealth that's been created? Are they using it on themselves? Or in this case, God gives him wisdom that he stores it up knowing that bad years are around the corner, right? Bad years are about to come. And he positions it not only so that the house of Pharaoh would be saved or the house of Egypt would be saved, but all the surrounding nations would be blessed because of the wisdom that God implants on his heart all the way and up to his very own family in the promised land in Canaan where they need to come out and get help because the famine extends far beyond the land of Egypt. So God, once again, is bringing something completely in full circle. And it says in Genesis 41, 3, now, therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man being Joseph and set him over the land of Egypt. He now is in that position of power. The sheaves, the wheat that was rising up also were prophetic in the context of what would happen. What brings him to that place of power? What brings him to that place of protection? What brings him to that place of provision? The wheat that ends up getting stored up in the barns of the lands of Egypt that would be a salvation to his very own family. So God brings it all the way back to that first part of the story. Did you think he wasn't going to do it, right? Of course God's going to do it. If he did it for him, guess what? He could do it for you. He brings him back to the place where his brothers are going to need to come from Canaan over to Egypt because of the famine that's in their land. And they're going to need to bow down before him so that they could get the food that they need just to survive. How amazing is that? That's the God we serve. Yes, there's twists and turns along the way. Yes, you might feel like giving up. Maybe your faith is waning even in this moment, but when we read stories like this, I hope it reignites your faith. To remember that the promises that God implants on your heart will always be yes and amen. The devil may try to stop them. We can kind of mess them up if we try to go about it in our own way and sin in the midst of it, right? We could derail them. We could make it take longer than it's supposed to do. But even in the midst of those things, God can still forgive. God can still redirect. God will still make it come to pass. How amazing is that? His word is true, just like with Abraham. And he waited on the Lord, and they ended up having that child. That child ends up being part of this story as the parents and grandparents of that. It's all tied together. All this stuff that we're reading is absolutely true. How cool is that? May we never, you guys look pretty bored about that. Something's wrong with you people. I mean, it is amazing to think about this story is true. How crazy is that? And he invites us into it. May Joseph's story remind us that God is still in control, that God still rescues, that God still cares, that God has not forgotten about you, that he wants you to dream again, and he wants to see your dreams fulfilled. Like Joseph's brothers, there comes a time when we need to kneel down. The best part of the story to me is when you approach chapter uh, 43. There's two sets of stories. The first one um, needs a little bit of preface in 43.23. Um, Joseph plays a bit of a trick on his brothers, as brothers sometimes do. Um, he puts some gold stuff inside of there so that the money that they brought to buy the food that they had, um, he actually reimburses. He puts it all back in there. So they're thinking, dude, we stole it. We're in trouble. We're, you know, who did this? Life's coming to an end. Um, and they come back with a very repentant heart and they come back with the money and they're like, we didn't take it. We don't know how it got in here, but we're bringing this back. And uh, they're fearful when they're reapproaching um, him. They don't even know it's his brother at the time that they're reapproaching. So this is the response that you see from him. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the Lord your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. He's saying, be at peace. Whatever your troubles, whatever your trials, whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, be at peace. Like the story of the prodigal son, God's waiting with open arms. In fact, he reiterates it. You see it a few times in scripture. Here's another scene in 43 verse 30. Then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother and he sought a place to weep. So he sees the fear in his brother's eyes. 
He remembers back to those early days out there in the field where he came up to them and he tried to share his dream and they threw him into the pit. Maybe you and I would have wanted to put a whooping on him for doing that when we're now in a position of power. And instead, tears well up in his eyes because he sees God's plan. Now I realize why I was in the pit. Now I realize why I was at Potiphar's house. Now I realize why I was in jail. Now I realize those false accusations had to happen to get me in jail so I could interpret that dream. Now that I've interpreted that dream, God's positioned me with Pharaoh. Now it's the end of that seven years of good times and we're in a season of famine. And God's placed me here and I have food and provision and abundance and power and authority that I could wield in a healthy way that would bring rescue to many people. And it all comes together for him and he's overcome. He's just weeping. Man, my brothers are restored to me. My brothers are restored to me. How amazing is that? The story comes full circle, but you need to realize that no matter what sin you've committed, no matter how far you've run from God, no matter whether you find yourself today, that God's waiting with open arms. When you go out there and you continue on in your sin, God's weeping over you. As we who are believers in this room, if you continue on in perpetual sin, God is weeping over you. God's not whack-a-mole God waiting for you to stick your head up so he can whack you. He's not doing that. He's weeping over you saying, come home. That's not the best plan that I have for you. Come home. I love you. Come await in my open arms. I'm ready to rescue. Not as Joseph did in a temporal sense where he saved those people for some seven years and even a generation that would go beyond it because next week we're going to get into a new story about Moses and then the Pharaoh who was at that time is long dead and the new Pharaoh inspired by the devil yet again, wants to keep the Jewish people down, wants to stop them from growing, wants to stop them from thriving, and the story kind of repeats itself in a similar fashion, and Moses rises up as a rescuer. God gives us all these Old Testament stories to long in our hearts for a real once and for all time rescue that would come from that lineage we talked about, from the boring section of scripture, where one day we would find out about this son of God named Jesus who was born in the natural from the lineage of David who would come after this, who would be the once and all time savior of the world. He puts these stories in there to create a longing in our heart for the real king of kings, for the real Lord of lords. And maybe he's doing that in your life right here, right now. I certainly hope so. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Lord, you are faithful, and your word is crazy. It is so amazing to read these things and then put them into context of what we see happening in the world around us today. May it inspire us today as we talk about these dreams. Would we be free to dream again in you? That freedom comes from obedience. That freedom comes from the loving kindness of knowing who we're rescued by, that we can serve you all the days of our life. So there's two groups of people that I really want to talk to today. The first one is believers. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured. But as you look at the landscape of your life, you're no longer dreaming. Maybe you've been beat up by the devil and and you just forgot about your dreams. Maybe you've been beat up by your own sin because you're caught in some stuff that you can't overcome. Maybe you've just been beat up because you haven't been connected with God lately. You haven't been reading his word. You haven't been spending time in prayer. You haven't been enjoying his presence or the fellowship with other believers. And God brought you here this morning to shake you up a bit. As a believer, maybe he's saying to you, today's the day you need to rededicate your life to him and say, from this moment forward, I'm putting a stake in the ground and I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to dream again. I'm going to fulfill the calling that you placed on my life. For some of you, that might be you today. Dare to dream again in Jesus. Yet for some of you, you might be here today, and these stories were unfamiliar to you. But for some reason, God's working in your heart, and he's calling you out of what we would say darkness into light. He's calling you, and you feel some tingling in your heart for some reason to say, man, this Jesus is true. I need to serve him and live for him for the first time. So whether you're ready to surrender your heart to him for the first time, or today's a day of rededication, I would love to pray with you. I'd love to join hands with you, and I promise to do nothing to embarrass you. But man, I would love to pray with you and celebrate with you and believe God with you for that victory. If that's you, everybody's head's bowed. No, nobody's looking around. Would you do me a favor? If that's you, just raise your hand up real high. I'd be glad and honored to pray for you. Is that you today? If that's you, raise your hand up so I could see it. Is there anybody today? I see your hands, ma'am. Thank you, Lord. 
right there on the front row. Thank you, God, worshiping God today. Father, we join with our sister in just dedicating or rededicating our life to you today. Father, we can't thank you enough for your presence in this place and your power to touch and change lives. Lord, you've touched mine. You've changed me. You've set me on fire. And I pray that you would do the same for everyone in this room. If they're not at that place where they're just on fire for you, Lord, I pray that you will ignite a refining fire in their life that would lead them to that place where they could only surrender their life to you, where they would serve you all the days of their life, where they would sacrifice for you, where they would live for you, where they would know that the calling and purpose that you placed on their life as a believer is to tell the world about you, just as you raised up Joseph as an earthly Savior for those people. You use people that are imperfect like us today to go out and tell the good news to all who are around us. We can also participate in your saving grace and seeing people to come to know you. So Lord, would you place that heart of mission inside of each of us? And Father, we do declare that Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. May we never forget it for some who might be saying that for the first time today. We thank you for what you're implanting in their heart. For others who are rededicating their life today, Lord, may they just be reminded of your goodness and your grace. And we just say together, Lord, we want to serve you all the days of our life. And Father, we dedicate our lives to you. We love you with everything that is within us. Use us to go out and tell the world about you and Jesus mighty and glorious name. And everybody says, God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you're new to Journey, come on up and say hello. Go get plugged into a small group. Sign up for some of these events and be there. Dream again, church. Dream again.